His true nature is one of the biggest and most tantalizing mysteries of Middle-earth. It has sparked conversation and theories for decades. And while one of my most popular videos covers the most likely of these theories, there is one I've not yet discussed. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we answer the question, could Tom Bombadil be J.R.R. Tolkien himself? No. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube supporters. Okay, okay, you're probably looking for a bit more in-depth answer than that. And truth be told, I've gotten a surprising number of comments on my previously mentioned Tom Bombadil video sharing the theory that Tom Bombadil was Tolkien himself, inserted into the story. These comments generally cite things like Tom Bombadil existing before Morgoth descended into Arda, and naturally, Tolkien himself existed outside the story before the tale of Middle-earth. But this is hardly an airtight argument. The same logic could be used to say that Tolkien was a Luvatar, the creator of the universe within Tolkien's great tale. For the record, Tolkien himself ruled out being a Luvatar when speaking of the destruction of the ring. The other power then took over, the writer of the story, by which I do not mean myself, that one ever-present person who is never absent and never named. Turning our attention back to Tom, though, another common thought is that perhaps Bombadil isn't affected by the ring because he is Tolkien himself. He isn't affected by the ring and doesn't interfere with the grand schemes of the world because he exists both inside and outside of it. As interesting of an idea as this may be, Tolkien spoke multiple times on who or what Tom Bombadil was in his letters, none of which indicate Tolkien felt this kind of connection to the character. We see Tolkien call him the spirit of the vanishing Oxford and Berkshire countryside, an intentional enigma that should be left unexplained, and of course, we find that the character himself was based on a doll belonging to Tolkien's children. The doll itself dressed just as Tom is described in the books. Amusingly, his son Michael was not overly fond of the doll and stuffed it down a toilet. As Humphrey Carpenter recalls in his Tolkien biography, Tom was rescued and survived to become the hero of a poem by the children's father, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, which was published in the Oxford Magazine in 1934. Indeed, Tolkien seemed hesitant to draw overly strong connections between himself and particular characters from his works. Fans will of course recall that the graves of he and Edith bear the names of Baron and Luthien. In letter 340 to Christopher, in the aftermath of Edith's passing, we find that this seems more a connection of Edith to Luthien, for it was she who inspired the character. Just like Baron, he was enamored of his Luthien, who danced in a woodland glade for him. As he told Christopher, in those days her hair was raven, her skin clear, her eyes brighter than you have seen them, and she could sing and dance. But the story has gone crooked, and I am left, and I cannot plead before the inexorable Mandos. While J.R.R. and Edith clearly had a connection to the characters of Baron and Luthien, there is one character Tolkien gave the strongest indication of being like himself. In letter 180 to a reader named Mr. Thompson, he states, I am not Gandalf, being a transcendent sub-creator in this little world. As far as any character is like me, it is Faramir, except that I lack what all my characters possess. Let the psychoanalysts note, courage. Tolkien would go on to mention that he gave a recurring dream of his to Faramir himself within The Lord of the Rings. For when Faramir speaks of his private vision of the Great Wave, he speaks for me. That vision and dream has been ever with me, and has been inherited, as I only discovered recently, by one of my children. Ironically, this child who had apparently inherited the dream was none other than Michael, the one who stuffed Tom Bombadil into a toilet. Later, in letter 213 to W.H. Auden, he speaks more about this vision. I have what some might call an Atlantis complex, possibly inherited, though my parents died too young for me to know such things about them, and too young to transfer such things by words. Inherited from me, I suppose, by only one of my children, though I did not know that about my son until recently, and he did not know it about me. I mean the terrible recurrent dream beginning with memory of the great wave, towering up 
and coming in ineluctably over the trees and green fields. I bequeathed it to Faramir. But perhaps most direct and poignant when looking at things that connect Tolkien to Faramir comes down to how they were both involved in, observe, and respond to war. As someone who fought in one world war, and decades later would see his own son fight in another, Tolkien would write in a letter to Christopher in 1944, the utter stupid waste of war, not only material, but moral and spiritual, is so staggering to those who have to endure it, and always was, despite the poets, and always will be, despite the propagandists. Not of course that it has not, is, and will be necessary to face it in an evil world, but so short is human memory and so evanescent are its generations, that in only about 30 years there will be few or no people with that direct experience, which alone goes really to the heart. The burnt hand teaches most about fire. Ten years later, readers would find Faramir's observations of war, which seemed to mirror Tolkien's own. War must be, while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend, the city of the men of Numenor. In the end, we can find bits of Tolkien in various parts of his writings. Sam's observation of the dead Haradrim soldier, another great example. Faramir is clearly the one Tolkien directly identified with, but today we will conclude with what is perhaps Tolkien's most overt indication of how he saw himself in Middle-earth. I am in fact a hobbit, in all but size. I like gardens, trees, and unmechanized farmlands. I smoke a pipe and like good plain food, unrefrigerated, but detest French cooking. I like, and even dare to wear in these dull days, ornamental waistcoats. I am fond of mushrooms out of a field, have a very simple sense of humor, which even my appreciative critics find tiresome. I go to bed late and get up late when possible. I do not travel much. While there's no indication that Tom Bombadil is some kind of self-insert of Tolkien, it's certainly fun to look at the connections between Tolkien and his created world. And while we may not see a one-for-one -one insert of Tolkien, the glimpses we do see of him, his life, and his faith make Middle-earth all the more grand. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, CCDC Red Team, Joe Tepper, The Mighty Mim, Andrew Carlisle, Swirl Traveler, Matthew Jeffrey, Leo Vittori, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Berto Berg, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Micah Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description to purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.